Live from the headquarters of Telus Your English in Quito, Ecuador. This is from the South, and I'm Sweeney Gray. Venezuelan President Nicolas Maduro says elections are needed to overcome the country's economic difficulties. In a wide-ranging news conference with the international media, Maduro also talked about the threat of U.S. oil sanctions, which he said would hurt the United States more than Venezuela, and the question of security on the border with Colombia. He said he wants to win April's presidential election fairly and squarely and believes this will enable a new era of prosperity. In order to win this economic war, we need to go to elections and win the elections. I have promised and made a commitment to Venezuela, and I have said, as surely as my name is Nicolás Maduro, when we win these elections, I will guarantee you economic stability and balanced prices, and we will begin a period of economic prosperity. President Maduro also repeated his call for a meeting with Colombia to draw up a plan for peace and security on their shared border. He said that President Santos' decision to move more troops to the border had been motivated by the visit of Rex Tillerson, but it was still an opportunity to promote peace. That is why I have proposed that our Defense Minister Padrino call Villegas, the Colombian Defense Minister, to agree this weekend to set a date for a meeting between the ministers of both countries to draw up a binational plan for peace and security for the whole border region, and most importantly, in the state of Táchira. The Vice President of Venezuela's National Electoral Council, Sandra Oblitas, has given an update on the electoral schedule ahead of the April election. Oblitas announced that there will be more than 15 audits carried out on the Venezuelan voting system. From the 24th to the 26th of February, candidate nominations can be made online. And then on the 26th and the 27th of February, those nominations will be ratified by the CNE. There will be 531 centers where voters can register, re-register, or change their polling station. Our correspondent, Laura Prada, has more from Caracas. Sandra Oblitas, the Vice President of the National Electoral Council here in Venezuela, presented the official electoral chronogram for this upcoming presidential election here in Venezuela. Since the 10th of February, already started the process of registration uh, here in Venezuela. People can do it in more than 500 uh, places throughout the country, and those Venezuelans living abroad can do it through the diplomatic missions of Venezuela in the world. Uh, one date I want to highlight is the 27th of February, because it's the last day for the formal presentation of uh, postulation candidates for this um, process. The other point, the other date of importance in this chronogram is the 26th of February because it's the date when we'll be starting the more than 15 uh, audits that will be taking place and will be uh, on the Venezuelan electoral system. The other date of importance is the 5th of March when the position on ballots will be presented and the uh, electoral list will be published. As you all know, from the 2nd to the 19th of April will be, holding, will be held the um, electoral campaign and on the 22nd of April will be taking place the presidential elections. The CNE said he uh, it is, this are, is committed with these elections and to give all the guarantees Venezuela needs to uh, go to these presidential elections. Also, that uh, the participants uh, and the political parties will be also given all the guarantees they need to, to be uh, part of this uh, process. And this process, of course, is based upon uh, peaceful coexistence by all parts participating. This is all I have for now, but we'll get back soon. We thank Laura Prada for that report. Cuba has condemned the interference of a number of Latin American countries in the internal affairs of Venezuela. Talisio's Laura Prada tweeted a statement from the Cuban Foreign Ministry, which says Cuba strongly condemns the interference and exclusion of Venezuela from the Americas summit and ratifies its solidarity with the civic military union of its people, led by the constitutional president, Nicolas Maduro. The statement published in Granma goes on, 
those who aim to overthrow the Bolivarian and Chavista revolution by unconstitutional, violent, coup-like means will bear a great responsibility before history. Ecuador's President Lenin Moreno has met his counterpart Juan Manuel Santos at the sixth bilateral summit in the Colombian city of Pereira. As he arrived, Moreno said he would ask Colombia for its support to protect the border of both countries share. This after the attacks that occurred a few weeks ago on both sides, which was blamed on drug traffickers. On Wednesday, the foreign and defense ministers from both nations highlighted the progress in cooperation and dialogue between their military and police authorities. Ecuador's Minister of Defense, Patricio Zambrano, said Ecuador will not give up on the fight against drugs and transnational crime. We'll take a short break now. Join us again after this look at what our multimedia colleagues are reporting on. One day, this nation will rise up. Welcome back. Venezuela's Foreign Minister Jorge Ariasa is in El Salvador in the second leg of his Latin American and Caribbean tour. Ariasa met with President Salvo Salvador Sanchez Seren. The Dignity Tour took Ariasa to Dominica on Wednesday and will hit the Dominican Republic on Friday. Ahead of the meeting, our correspondent Ernesto Alvalos sent us this report from San Salvador. I'm here at the presidential house where Salvadoran Foreign Minister Hugo Martinez and President Salvador Sanchez Seren will hold a private meeting with Venezuelan Prime Minister Jorge Arreaza, who is touring various Latin American countries. The purpose of this meeting is to strengthen the union and solidarity of the countries in the region. Foreign Minister Arreaza plans to meet with the political commission of the FMLN and end his day by meeting with social ministers in solidarity with Venezuela. Arreaza and his committee are planning to depart at 4 p.m. local time and will head to Santo Domingo. He will be departing from Oscar Arnulfo Romero International Airport. That's all I have for now. Back to you. Campesino movements and other organizations have been presenting their demands to the Colombian government at the Agricultural, Ethnic and Popular Summit, which is analyzing the human rights situation in the country. During the meeting, social organizations said that more than 200 social leaders have been killed in Colombia since the Havana peace agreements. They blamed the authorities for not taking the right measures to stop these crimes, and they demanded that the president, Juan Manuel Santos, address the country's own problems and put aside the constant attacks on Venezuela. 
The government hasn't assumed the responsibility of a lack of control measures. There are no measures against the paramilitary attacks on our territories. There are no actions to fulfill the peace agreement with the FARC group, no actions to reactivate the peace talks with the ELN group and stop the armed conflict. In this context, indigenous campesinos and Afro-descendant communities are in serious vulnerable situations. And a human rights defender was assassinated in Bogota during the meeting between the Ethnic and Popular Agrarian so Summit and the government. Our correspondent, Jose Manuel Jimenez, has more. In the last hours, social organizations have denounced an attack against a human rights defender, Germán Espinel, in the city of Bogotá. The attack was carried out by two armed men on a motorcycle in one of the capital's popular neighborhoods. According to social organizations, the human rights defender is in good health, as he was wearing a bulletproof vest when he was attacked. This attack occurred while meetings between the ethnic and popular agrarian summit and the government to define the strategies to protect the social leaders and defenders of human rights. To this date, 30 social leaders have been assassinated, and since the signing of the peace agreement between the FARC and the government, more than 200 social leaders have been assassinated. Back to you. There is pressure by conservative sectors linked to the church who are preventing a comprehensive sexual education project from moving forward in Panama. This despite rising teenage pregnancy and STD indexes. Pregnancy and STD statistics among teenagers in Panama continue to cause alarm and are the reason why authorities are urging the approval of a sex education law. This law must be approved. It can't be put off any longer. The people need it, especially the young people. Data compiled by the health ministry throughout 2017 shows that 9,912 young people, ranging from 10 to 19 years old, were admitted to the ministry's pregnancy control program. Despite registering about 1,000 fewer cases than in 2016, the number continues to be alarming. Other official statistics show that 85% of children are born out of the wedlock and that over 50% of STD cases are registered among the young. Regardless, the proposed law can't move forward due to pressure exerted by conservative sectors linked to the church. Panamanian society would not only be stalled, but it would start moving backwards by losing any strides we have made. A lot of people believe this law would promote promiscuity, but they are wrong. This would promote useful education and sexual health for everyone in society. Conservative sectors continue to exert pressure during legislative assemblies stalling in the project under the argument that all education must be regulated by the parents. Many parents are ignorant or lack the capacity to talk about all of the topics that need to be covered in regards to healthy sexuality. They may be unable to provide proper education. Other sectors continue to organize to ask the government that personal beliefs are not placed above the well-being of future generations. In Peru, a fire inside a prison in the north of the country killed at least five people and left 29 others injured on Wednesday. The manager of a youth rehabilitation center in Trujillo, Julio Mangan, said the fire was not caused by a, a protest against the center. Mangan said it was a fight between two gangs after inmates burned their mattresses and the firemen had to enter the building to rescue them. The disappearance of 140,000 hectares of rainforest in Peru is causing long-term environmental problems, a situation that indigenous organizations say is generated by policies that favor big companies. More in the next report. The Amazonian regions of Loreto, Ucayali, and San Martin are the areas most affected by deforestation. According to government reports, 60,000 hectares of forest have been replaced by oil palm crops, affecting hundreds of indigenous communities, such as the Quechua people. La expropiación de las tierras. Big companies expropriate our territory. They take away our lands. Companies are not only involved on a single level. They bring crime, they bring death threats, they bring prostitution, they bring environmental pollution. According to the Amazonian Andes Monitoring Project, in 2017, gold mining, agribusinesses, and logging deforested 143,000 hectares of jungle. 
Indigenous organizations put blame on the government for licensing the rainforest to companies with the promise of bringing prosperity, but in reality, they create huge damage to the environment. We know there are big transnational and economic interests behind this. The government doesn't care about social, environmental and indigenous communities issues. This is the main reason why our human rights are being violated. Civil society organizations say that Peru is violating international agreements which exist in order to combat climate change. While on the one hand they prohibit deforestation, on the other hand they're promoting concessions in order to change land usage. What the companies do is they simply apply the standard law. That is the excuse they give. They say, I do not infringe the standard law because I'm permitted to do this according to the standard law that allows me we are arriving at an extreme point at which companies do not have to modify to change the rules because they have been established. Due to the increase in deforestation of the Amazon, it is expected that in the coming decades the temperature will increase and soil humidity will decrease, affecting the diversity of flora and fauna and causing extreme and continuous natural phenomena, as warned by the United Nations Organization for Food and Agriculture. We'll take another short break. Join us after this look at what our multimedia team is reporting on. So it's incredible now to have the DNA data that really shows us what this guy looked like. You know, the hair, the eyes, the face, that combination of blue eyes and dark skin, really very striking, something we wouldn't have imagined. And to also get from the DNA. Welcome back. Cyril Ramaphosa has become South Africa's president after the embattled leader Jacob Zuma resigned on Wednesday. Ramaphosa was the only person nominated in Parliament, so a vote was not needed to make it official. During his speech to Parliament, the wealthy former businessman said that corruption was on his radar. Issues that have to do with corruption, issues of how we can straighten out our state-owned enterprises, and how we deal with state capture uh, is are issues that are on our radar screen. Those are issues that we're going to be addressing, and tomorrow we will also have an opportunity to outline some of the steps that we are going to be taking. Moving ahead, let's have a look at some other news from around the world. At least 17 people have been killed in a shooting at a Florida school. The victims included students and adults. The police have identified the attacker as 19-year-old former student Nicholas Cruz, who was expelled on disciplinary grounds. He has been taken into custody. There have been 18 gun attacks in U.S. schools this year. Annually, there are nearly 33,000 deaths related to gun violence in the U.S. A French court has sentenced two men linked to the 2015 Paris attacks, in which 130 people were killed. 
The Islamic State group claimed responsibility for the attack. Another suspect, Javed Venduad, who rented his apartment to the attackers, was acquitted by the court as nothing suspicious was found against him. It's a bit of mixed feelings because at the same time a just decision concerning the first two suspects and a decision that will appear to civil parties as unusual for the man who provided accommodation for the terrorist, who was Jawad bin Daud, which can be interpreted as, even if we are part of the circle, we can get away with it. So we hope that the prosecution will appeal this decision with regard to Jawad bin Daud. 42-year-old Sebastian Uprimni has become the first athlete from Colombia to participate in the cross-country event in the Winter Olympics. Colombia sent a small delegation of four athletes, all of them are first-timers and in their 40s. They will be participating in skating and skiing events. For skier Sebastian, it's a dream come true. I just decided this crazy dream to, to, to happen. So, so it's a different story. I'm not a full-time athlete. I'm more the... The, the, the journeyman who had a dream and who, who wanted to make it happen. Hundreds of Boko Haram suspects have been brought to trial in an open court in Kanji in central Nigeria. The court will decide whether they will be prosecuted, sentenced or released. Earlier this week, the first suspect from the group was sentenced to 15 years in prison. Boko Haram is being tried for militant insurgency and involvement in the kidnapping of more than 200 schoolgirls from the town of Chibok in 2014. A spectacular show of molten iron art was performed in the city of Zhang Jiakou in North China to mark the Chinese New Year. The artists hurl molten iron with temperatures as high as 1600 degrees Celsius against the wall. That turns the burning metal into an arc of sparks. The tradition of burning iron display is more than 500 years old. This performance is part of the annual Spring Festival and Light Show. And that brings us to the end of this news brief. For these and many other stories, you can find them on our website at tellusyourtv.net forward slash English. And join us on social media, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. For Tell Us Your English, I'm Sweeney Gray. Thank you so much for watching.